Well, good evening. It's good to be uh, good to be with you as we start a new series, uh, which we're going to take the the book that's often overlooked towards its uh, its predecessor, the book of Second Peter. Um, we spent a lot of time, more time, I think, in the church talking about First Peter than its Second Peter. And as the second kid, I, I find this a problem that we need to look not just at the oldest and the first, but the second as well. So we're going to spend several weeks together over the, the end of May and through the month of June diving into the book of Second Peter and this theme of promises that runs throughout the book that we look back to God's promises that have been fulfilled. It gives us confidence as we look forward to the future promises that God has made us in his word. Well, when I was young, I still remember uh, a particular day of fourth grade. Fourth grade, I was 10 years old, so this was a couple decades ago. Now, I, I remember sitting there, and, and for me as a fourth grader, maybe like many of you, I had two favorite classes when I was a fourth grader, P.E. followed by recess, all right? And I, I loved to get out and to play and to have fun on the gym playing basketball and dodgeball. It's what I really loved. I was a good student as well, but I really loved that. And our, our, I remember our seating arrangement for the first, probably the first quarter was alphabetical, my last name being Best, so I got stuck right there in the front row, as the bees often do. But then the second quarter, it switched, and I was now in the back row, the favorite place for every fourth grader that likes to cause trouble, the back row. And I remember clearly one day, as I was getting in trouble constantly in class, so much so that the teacher called me and I had to stay at the start of lunch to talk to her because my talking was becoming so disruptive to her and the class. Now, I wish I could tell you that she was just wondering what was going on because I had never to this point acted up and this was the first problem I had ever had in class. That would be a lie. That would be a lie. I loved to give my opinion to my teachers and the people around me. But as, as she drew me aside, I was like, why are you being so disruptive in class? Why do you keep talking to the people next to him? I had a, a simple explanation that I didn't want to admit to anyone else. It was this, that since moving to the back seat of the class, I couldn't read the spelling words on the board. They were fuzzy, and I didn't want to raise my hand as a 10-year-old and say, I can't read that. I thought something was wrong with me. So I was simply asking my friends every time the teacher wrote something on the board, what, what did Mrs. Ayala write? What is she writing? I can't read it. And it was there the dreadful news that any 10-year-old whose favorite activity is PE and recess finds out, I needed glasses. I needed glasses. I was nearsighted. I, I was so nearsighted that I couldn't read things that were written on the board from where I sat, and ever since then, part of my daily routine, it is, as it is for many of us, is glasses. See, see it, this idea of being nearsighted so that we lose focus on the bigger picture isn't just something that happens visually, but it's often something that happens in our lives. When difficulties, when circumstances, when problems arise, when situations come, our tendency as people often is to be nearsighted, to, to focus on what's here right in front of us so that we miss Everything beyond that. And in the passage we're going to work through this, uh, this evening in, in chapter 1, talks about this idea of people being so nearsighted that they're almost blind. And, and Peter wants to prevent his audience from having that. So if you have your Bibles with you tonight, would you open them please to the book of Second Peter. The book of Second Peter, if, if you're new, it's right near the end of your Bible. If you're at the back, go to Revelation and it's forward just a few books um, if you uh, received a handout when you walked in today, the, the entire text um, for tonight will be printed on there as well. We'll be reading um, from the, the ESV version. And as Peter starts and he dives into this, this book tonight, um, he reminds them, he kind of goes back at this first chapter to the fundamentals of what they have in Jesus Christ. He brings them back to the starting point by reminding them of who the promised salvation that they have received from the promised Messiah. And as we look tonight, we're going to discover three distinctives of a 2020 faith. Three distinctives of 2020 faith. Not a faith that's so nearsighted that it loses focus on things, but a faith that is 2020 that sees the world as God would have us to live in it. Verses 1 and 2 say this. Simeon, or Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you 
in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So we see here clearly this is Peter. This is the apostle Peter that if you're familiar with our New Testament was one of the disciples of Jesus was given as an apostle who went around, lived his life as an evangelist going around telling people about Jesus Christ. He identifies himself in two ways. First, a servant or some translations would say a slave. It's the same idea, a servant or a slave of Jesus Christ. This is a title first designated Peter's humility, but also the honor that he has of who he serves. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. Not only that, but he's an apostle. He, he writes as one who has been sent and commissioned with the very authority of Jesus Christ himself. So he comes to them humbly, but with the authority of Jesus Christ with a message. And his audience is to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Now, this phrase is, is a little different. We don't see this phrase much anywhere else in the Bible, this phrase of, of equal standing. What Peter gets out right at the front is lest anyone think that they should be puffed up or, or think of themselves as superior because of their ethnic heritage, as often was the case then of Jewish Christians. He wants them to know it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, a Gentile, whether you come from a believing or an unbelieving family, in Christ there is no rank. There is no tier of people. We all stand in an equal standing. And so Gentile believers were just as much, and still today are just as much, a part of the family of God as Jewish believers were. Praise God, right, that there's no second-class citizens in the family of God. There's no second-class citizens. And why is that? Why is that? It's because each and every one of us, whether we're Jew or Gentile alike, each and every person needs the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the only way, the thing that gives us equal standing is this righteousness of Jesus. And then he gives them a fairly normal um, introduction. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. He jumps into the letter in verses 3 and 4. says this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and his, excuse me, his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires." The first distinctive of 2020 faith that we see here, the first distinctive is the provision of faith. We see here the provision of faith. Being this, before Peter gets to anything that we are to do or anything that we are to live, he starts at the very fundamentals and says this, the basis for your faith, the basis for all action in the Christian life is this, is that God saves us. The provision of faith we have is not anything that we do, but it's all the work of God on our behalf. And as a Christian, it's not, it's something that we receive that God has given to us. It says here that his divine power, looking back to Jesus. So with Jesus's power is granted to us all things for life and godliness. Jesus's power has given us everything. You cannot add to it and you need not subtract from it. You need nothing more and nothing less for salvation than the work of Jesus Christ alone. And when Peter thinks of Jesus's power, one can only imagine all the things that he's thinking of. This is Peter who was one of the three who saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration as he beheld God's glory descend on him. This was Peter who was one of the first witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the appearance of our Lord after his crucifixion. He thinks of all that Jesus has done, his entire saving work, and says all of this is enough. His divine power has given us everything we need to be like God. Everything comes from Jesus. He provides for us everything we need for faith. He continues, it's given to us through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellencies. Again, there's the idea there of throughout the Bible of what we call predestination or election of calling people to follow after him. And so God just doesn't wait. God calls people to follow him. Jesus calls us to follow after him. And he calls us to his own glory and excellence. 
His glory and excellence. Uh, one scholar wrote that, that what Jesus is calling us to is the divine moral excellence of Christ, focusing especially on the beauty of his goodness. See, when Jesus calls us to come to him, we don't answer the call with a begrudging, okay. This isn't the kind of call that when your mom told you to go clean your room, you were like, all right, I guess, I guess I'll go and I'll do it. When Jesus calls, we are overwhelmed by his greatness and his beauty, and it's our joy to respond to that call. I've been, uh, I've been reading this year in the evenings through the Chronicles of Narnia series. And I love, as I'm, I think I'm five or six books in, at how throughout the series different characters respond to, to, the, to Aslan, who's the Christ figure throughout. But one of the things that, that always describes how people are is they can't quite explain why they're so drawn to him. They say, I, I, I wish he was here. And when they see him, there's a fear, but they, they always want to move closer. They're overcome with the beauty of Aslan. When Christ calls us, when he calls us to salvation, we see the greatness of his holiness, and it draws us into him. Jonathan Edwards, the, the great American theologian, wrote a lot about being drawn into the beauty of Jesus Christ. He said this, But saints and angels behold the glory of God, which consists in the beauty of his holiness. And it is this sight only that will melt and humble the hearts of men, wean them from the world, draw them to God, and effectually change them. The first glimpse of the moral and spiritual glory of God shining into the heart produces all these effects, as it were, with an omnipotent power which nothing can withstand. He writes on how when we see the, the beauty of Jesus Christ, our hearts cannot help but be changed. And so this, this, the same God who saves us draws us not out of our stubborn unwillingness to follow, but we, we see his beauty and we want to follow after him. Verse 4 continues, it says, By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. This is looking back um, to, to the promises in the Old Testament continually made about a salvation that was to come from a Messiah who is yet to come. And Peter writes that, that the Messiah has come and it is Jesus and all those promises of salvation have found their fulfillment in him. The promises of being given a new heart find themselves in fulfillment with Jesus Christ and what he has provided to him. What Peter grounds this passage on before he gets to the future promises of God that we look at is before we think of the future promises of God, we should stop and think back to the past promises of God. God promised the Messiah and he promised where he would come from, what his life would be like, the suffering he would go under, that he would die, that he would be raised from the dead. We look back at all that God has promised in the Messiah and we can look and see it was true. God has been faithful to his promises. And as we think of how God has been faithful to his promises, we can be confident looking forward to the future that God will be faithful again. This is kind of just common practice as you think about it. If you have a friend who asks for money periodically, hey, can I have $20? Can I have $50? But every time they do, they're sure to pay it back within a week or two, and they ask you for a little more money, are you likely to give them some? Yeah. Yeah, you'll, you'll lend them $20 or $50. But if you have a friend who's borrowed $20 from you every other week for a year, after a while, you're going to be like, all right, all right, enough is enough, right? Because you keep saying you're going to pay me back, but you never have. God doesn't tell us to trust him, even though nothing says we should trust his promises, but, but we should just bank on it because maybe he'll come through. God is, is a God that we can look back and we see how every time he's done exactly as he's promised, and when we look forward to the future, we can continue that expectation will continue to happen. He continues this verse in verse 4 by saying that we've been given this great promise of salvation so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. This phrase, partakers of the divine nature, is a, is a very confusing phrase, and it's been somewhat controversial, especially if you're familiar with Eastern Christianity and Orthodox at all. So, so real quickly, what does this mean? It means simply that God has given to his people all we need to live a life pleasing to him. He's given to us everything we need 
to live a life that honors him and escapes the evil of the world that surrounds us. He's given us to be partakers of his divine nature. See, through our union with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in each and every one of us. And we have a part of God that lives in us. We have the Holy Spirit who dwells inside each and every one of us. And one day we'll be fully glorified. But even now, we participate in what God has done through Jesus Christ, and we can live a life pleasing to God. But what does it not mean that some people think that this passage means? This passage does not teach that if you believe in Jesus, you are fully divine and you are a God. Some would have it say the church, we partake in the divine nature. Doesn't it say you take on the full divine nature? But we, we partake in it. It also doesn't mean that if you are a Christian, you must live a sinless life. Some would say that to partake in the divine nature means that you will only live a sinless life. That's clearly not true. And that's just a perversion of what he is writing here. So why does he write this? He simply is writing to a very Gentile and Hellenistic, a Greek-speaking world most likely, and is using phrases that were common in their vernacular, and he's adapting them to say, hey, this is kind of how you talk. This is what we have in Jesus. Think of it this way. This is a confusing phrase in the Bible. But think of it this way. I taught this afternoon at 1130. I taught high school students. I don't talk to high school students the same way I talk with you. Right? I talk with them differently because they're in a different stage of life. They're younger. There's this Generation Z. Right? They're always on their phones. They're Snapchat. They're Instagram. All, the, all these things. Right? And I, that's how I talk with them in a different way than I talk with a mixed audience of largely adults. In a similar way, Peter brings in this terminology because of his audience. He starts with this foundational provision of faith, that God has saved us. We can look to the future promises of God because we look back to the, to the, best, excuse me, the past promises of God and we see God's faithfulness there. So the first foundation, the first distinctive, excuse me, is this provision of faith. The second distinctive in verses 5 to 9 we see is the evidence of faith in our lives. The, the evidence of faith in the life of every believer. Verses 5 to 9 say this. For this very reason... Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So we see Peter lists out here the evidences that we have that we can be confident of the faith that we have received from Jesus Christ. Notice that he says, excuse me, for this very reason, make every effort. So we strive to follow after God, not to achieve salvation but in response to the salvation we've received. We strive and make efforts not to achieve it, but because we already have received it. He makes sure we don't mistake what comes first. We don't strive to achieve salvation. God has saved us, and now because he's given us his power, we come alongside with his power with our effort as well. And there's a starting point to it all. Notice the starting point is to make every effort to supplement your faith. It starts with faith. Faith is fundamental. Faith is the foundation of all the life pleasing to God. If we don't have faith, as the author of Hebrews reminds us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we start with faith, and then he lists out several other evidences, attributes, characteristics of our lives that should be true if we are walking with God. First is this, add to your faith virtue, virtue or goodness, moral kind of virtue and good things. To add to virtue, knowledge, not just a, a, a knowledge of, of good things and of scripture, but the ability to discern God's will and live in obedience to where God has placed you in the world. To add to your knowledge, self-control, that we're not dissuaded by other um, religions, we're not dissuaded by our own emotions and act accordingly, but instead we have self-control. To add to self-control, steadfastness, that it's, this is an endurance, a keeping going and sticking to God through hard times. Add to the steadfastness, godliness, honoring God in everything that we do. 
and adding to that brotherly affection, especially referring to relationships that should um, define us within the body of Christ. Now, when Peter writes these things, he's not thinking of a sequential list, like you got to master one before you move to the other. This isn't uh, a video game list where you got to beat one level before you move to the next. So think, all right, I got to focus on virtue, um, which is nice because now I don't have to practice self-control when I get on the highway on the way home, right? I am just starting on base one tonight. He, he's not saying these, these go one down and the other. He's saying all of these together, you need, as a Christian, these are evidences of God working in your life, and they should be focuses of these being true in each and every one of our lives. Our spiritual report card, if it were these things, our goal should be to receive an A in each and every one of these categories. You may have, uh, may have often heard the phrase, D's get degrees. D's get degrees. I heard that a lot when I was in college and high school, to which I would always reply, and if you're a student tonight, I will make sure to tell you this but they don't get college scholarships, all right? So unless your parents are millionaires, just remember that, all right? But D's get degrees. It's this attitude of, I'm just going to get by with doing as little as I possibly can to skirt through and make it through. That attitude has no place for a Christian in their walk with God. That attitude has no place for a Christian in their walk with God. God saved me. I'm just going to kind of live, get by, do as little work as possible, just skirt through and make it into heaven one day, like sliding and barely safe. All right, I'm good. That's, that's what God's called me to. That's not at all the attitude that God would have for his people. The culmination, the culmination of all these characteristics finds itself finally after brotherly affection with love. With love. There's a reason that, that Peter starts with faith and ends with love. Because all of our actions are to be driven out of the fact that we have faith in God, and they find their ultimate expression in our love for other people and our love for God. It was Jesus, when asked to summarize the greatest commandment, said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love is the pinnacle of what we each should be striving to in our lives, the pinnacle evidence that we are Christ and that the faith that we have is real. Verse 8, he reminds us that if these qualities, if these characteristics are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. So, so they encourage you, they allow you to be effective in your evangelism, in your outreach. They allow you to be fruitful in your walk with God, if these characteristics are true in your life. But notice this, whoever lacks these qualities, whatever believer would think, I, I just need to pray, and I'm getting to heaven, and that's all I need. I, I just pray for salvation, I don't need to live any differently. Peter addresses that person in verse 9, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So if you don't think your life has to change once you've been saved, you haven't understood what the Bible really teaches about salvation. If you don't think you have to change your life once Christ has come into it, you don't understand what the Bible says about what our life in Christ should be like. So these characteristics of faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love, these are to be the evidences that God is at work in our life and that our faith is real in our walk with God. Now, I don't know about you, but, but when I find a good show on Netflix, I could watch it for a long time. I could watch it. It's called binge watching, right? It, it's, you can sit there and it sucks you in and there's no commercials and afterwards it pops up. Do you want to play the next episode? And I'm like, what a silly question. Yes, of course. Play the next episode. I need to know what happens. And I especially get sucked in when there are these crime dramas. But what often happens is it's not like a crime drama where it's one episode happens and you see the crime, you see the everything advance to the end and it's solved. But there's these ones where it's a whole season spent solving one crime. These are a real investment. And what happens is in these episodes is over and over again, you'll have these detectives who will be trying to solve a crime. And they're digging for evidence. They're digging for evidence on who did it. And in almost every series, at some point, the detectives meet with the prosecuting attorneys. Detectives say, hey, listen, we know who did it. I'm convinced it was this guy. It was this gal. They are guilty of the crime. And the attorney says, great. Now you just got to find the proof. 
right? You got to find the evidence that they did it. You got to give me evidence because so I'm going to bring it to court. I'm not just going to say our gut feel is this person. I have to have evidence to back up the claim that they are guilty. My friends, if we're to claim the name of Christ in our lives, we're to claim we're Christians, we should have evidence in our lives to back that up by how we live. People should see your life and say, that's different. That's different than my life. The love they have for people, I don't don't think I love people like that. The way they talk about their church, it's not just this institution, this thing they go to, but it's like like they love the people there and they sacrifice their time. They they sacrifice their money. That's crazy to our world that, that people would do that that they would remain steadfast to God in in difficult times, that they wouldn't turn and blame him. My friends, our lives should look different if the gospel has taken root in our heart. When people see your life, when people see my life, is there evidence of faith? Is there evidence of God's work? Or are they like, that person says they're a Christian, but I don't see a lot of evidence for it. Because these are the characteristics of our life. These are the evidences that show that God has saved us. Well, first, we, we saw the provision of faith, that it comes from Jesus alone. The evidence of faith worked out these things in our life. Peter finishes this section with the urgency of faith. The urgency of faith. Verses 10 to 15 say this. Therefore, brothers... Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Notice the urgency of which Peter writes this. We see here that this is near the end of Peter's life. He knows that he is soon to die. Notice the urgency. He commends him to be all the more diligent to confirm their calling. He intends to always remind them, to stir them up by way of reminder that they should make every effort at any time to recall these things. See, for for Peter, this, this following of Christ in our lives was to be of supreme importance. It was an urgent matter that we take seriously and that his, the followers of Jesus take seriously their walk with God. This is not something that we can shove aside and focus on another time when we have more space in our schedule. This was an urgent matter. He writes to them to confirm, in verse 10, to confirm their calling and election. Not to earn their calling and election, but to confirm it by how they've lived their lives. And two reasons he gives. He gives a negative and a positive. The negative reason is um, if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. That doesn't mean you will never sin, but, but when it comes to the final judgment, you'll be able to stand knowing that your faith has been confirmed through your life. And on a positive side, if you live this way, you'll be richly provided an entrance into the eternal kingdom of God. That's the underlying motivation of our lives is we know we will each meet our Lord and Savior one day, and what will he say to us when we walk in? I don't know about you, but I want that richly provided entrance into the kingdom of God when I meet him someday. There's a temptation for some people to see this list of of commands that Peter gives. Add these things to your lives. To hear the urgency to which he says, I I want you to recall this at any time, at any moment. Be all the more diligent in doing these things. And there's 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 a temptation for some of us to look at Peter's attitude in his writing and think, that sounds legalistic. That sounds like legalism, like he's telling them they got to do all this stuff. They they have to to do these things. Now, now the difficulty in this, between a legalist and a sincere God-seeking person, their actions could be entirely the same. Someone practicing legalism and someone sincerely following after God in their heart, their actions can be entirely the same. 
I love this week I read, legalism is a state of the heart, not of the hands. It's about self-righteousness versus Christ-righteousness. What Peter is, is saying here is not legalism. It's not do these things, have these virtues true in your life so that you may receive salvation. What he's saying is you've received salvation through Christ. And as you behold how amazing he is, he motivates us to live a life pleasing to him. Oftentimes, those who accuse others of legalism, I found actually do this to excuse the laziness in their own walk with God. When they see other people making efforts, like, well, you have to pop up a notification on your phone to read the Bible? That's so legalistic. And I'm like, you know, I just have a bad memory, right? And I forget, if you set an alarm so that you remember to pray in the afternoon, it's not that you're a legalist, it's that you want to make sure you spend time with God. And oftentimes people who have attitudes like, oh, you can't do that stuff, they, they do it because of their own laziness and their own walk towards God. See, salvation without a transformation in our lives is a contradiction, according to the Bible. In our world, we are inundated with urgent things all the time, right? Everything comes to our attention, and with the rise of technology, we're bombarded by messages that call for our attention, call for our concern and our focus all the time. I see this, and I see this overused a lot. I don't know about you, but I see this in my emails all the time, urgent. All right. A few years ago, I received um, something from a car dealership for the car owner that said, urgent recall. I was like, okay, this is urgent. I clicked it and opened it. And it said, there's a problem with your gas line that if you get it fixed, if you don't get it fixed, your car may explode. That's pretty urgent. All right. I, I made time out of my schedule to go to the car. I'm like, okay, I'm stopping what I'm doing. I'm going to take that car. I don't want to blow up. Right? I, I don't want that in my life. There's been an email coming to me for several months for the car I own now. Urgent. There's a problem that your tailgate may not open as fast as it should. I'm like, that's not a big urgent problem in my life that my tailgate takes two seconds instead of one and a half seconds to open. I have not pre prioritized my schedule around getting it done. I have a, I, as a church email address. I have lots of emails coming in from ministries and organizations. And there's one organization this is so funny because I was thinking of it, and then I literally got an email from them yesterday. Every email that I get from this ministry, which does great work, every one has started the first subject line is capitalized, urgent in all capital letters. I'm like, man, if every email is urgent, none of them are urgent, right? If everything is so urgent, like, how do you get my attention when it actually is an urgent need? My friends, our world is crying out, urgent need, focus on this. No, you have to focus on your career. You have to focus on this. Focus on yourself. Do this for you. It's crying out for our attention in all these different ways. Can I propose to you today that if you're a believer, walking with God, seeking spiritual maturity is your most urgent need. It's not your career. It's not advancing to the next pay scale. It's not getting that new apartment or condo or home. It's not even your friends, not even your family. Your most urgent need is to walk closer with God day by day. That's the most urgent need for every single believer. Seeking spiritual maturity in our lives is not an option. It's not something that we can pick and choose. If you're a follower of Christ, it's what God expects and actually commands from each and every one of us to seek after. So if you're a Christian tonight, if you're a Christian and you're here and you're just kind of floating by, you're kind of like, I believe in salvation, it's kind of my, my fire insurance, my get out of hell ticket and I'm going to live my life my way. Can I encourage you tonight? That's, that's not what God has called his people to. That's not a life that's pleasing or honoring to him. God calls us not just to salvation, but he calls us to walk with him, to spiritual maturity, to transformation of our lives. If you're not a Christian and you've come here tonight, maybe thinking that Christianity, this list is what you thought Christians had to do to achieve salvation, can I remind you, can I encourage you tonight, salvation is all about God in his beauty, offering his son, Jesus Christ, to take the place for our sin as we sung, he was rose again from the third day. He has provided everything we need for life and godliness. You don't have to keep striving after him. Instead, you can submit your life to him and, and accept salvation tonight. 
If you're a legalist tonight, doing things to win God's approval, stop trying so hard. Start trusting God. Stop trying so hard and start trusting in God for salvation rather than your own efforts. And if you're a Christian here tonight, and I know many of you are like this, and you're, you're in your life, you're making every effort, it really is your urgent priority to grow in spiritual maturity, to walk with God. Can I just encourage you tonight? Keep it up. Keep it up. The road to maturity is hard. Lots of these virtues are not easy to come by. No one's learned steadfastness by going through an easy life. It only comes through difficulty and trial and tribulation. Can I just encourage you to keep it up? It's worth it. The life that God has for his people is worth it. Keep seeking after him. As we think of God's promises in the future, be reminded of what he's done in the past. His promise to salvation, the fulfillment of promises in Jesus, his faithfulness to his people always. God, we thank you that you are a faithful God. God, we thank you that everything we need for salvation is found in Jesus Christ, that he alone can save us. God, we thank you that, that you call us to you and you transform us and you don't leave us, but you send us your spirit to walk with us. God, may we be encouraged tonight that the life that you've called us to is worth living. It's worth suffering for. It's worth giving our lives to because you're that great. God, we pray that you would transform our hearts, renew in us desire day by day to follow after you. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.